In this lesson, we're going to talk about how we move away from the Earth-centered solar system of Ptolemy and to a Sun-centered system. And there are three main players in this game. And those three players um, came up with this picture. One was Nicholas Copernicus, Brahu Tahe, and Johannes Kepler. So Nicholas Copernicus came up with a system where the sun was at the center and the earth was the third planet out and you can see the moon orbiting the earth in this old picture which is a dramatic change from the picture of Ptolemy. Um, this wasn't a new idea, <clears throat> it was an idea that had never been put to use with mathematics to make predictions. So Nicholas Copernicus was the first one to apply mathematics to this problem and <clears throat> he was unable to leave the idea of circular orbits and that created a lot of problems in his model. So his model ended up being no more accurate than Ptolemy and people didn't want to leave 2,000 years of tradition for a model that's no more accurate than the one they already had. At, slightly after that we had Tahoe Brahe. Tahoe Brahe was a very wealthy man and he was also very interested in astronomy and he was quite the character. Um, there's one story where he got in a duel over who was the better mathematician with a fellow student and lost part of his nose. So he fashioned a new piece of a nose out of silver and gold. So he had a silver and gold nose tip. But he made very accurate um, naked eye observations and he built the the best naked eye observatory in history um, to do this and his his measurements were accurate to within one arc second or one arc minute I'm sorry and that is about the width of a fingernail held out at arm's length so the telescope had not yet been invented he tried to model his data um, using a sun-centered system and was unsuccessful so he proposed a system that had the sun orbiting the earth and all of the other planets orbiting the sun but this didn't make a lot of sense to very many people so not many people followed his system he did have the good sense to hire a young mathematician to help analyze his data and that mathematician was Johannes Kepler so Kepler was the first one that tried to match Tahoe's observations with circular orbits and he came very close, but he found an eight arc minute discrepancy in his calculations. And eight arc minutes is about one fourth the size of the full moon. And a lot of people at that time would have just set it aside to observational error. But Kepler really believed in Tahu Brahe's observations. So he didn't believe he could ignore those eight seconds of arc. And when he tried to fix the problem, it gave him some new ideas and it totally reformed our ideas in astronomy. So the idea was that planets move in ellipses. So Kepler's first law is that planets move in ellipses. And you will find on the website and on ANGEL a handout on what is an ellipse and how to draw ellipses. And this is a laboratory which will be due with the, um, with the lesson. So be sure to take a look at that handout and follow the instructions for the laboratory. So Kepler came up with three laws. So let's review those three laws. So the first law is that planets orbit the sun in ellipses. So this was a dramatic change in thinking over everybody that came before him. So an ellipse is like a squash circle. It has two focal points instead of one. So if you want to draw an ellipse, you would have to tie your string instead of around a pin and draw a circle. You'd have to put it around two pins and draw an ellipse. You will see this in the laboratory. So planets follow these elliptical patterns. Now elliptical patterns have the sun at one of the two focal points. Here are the two focal points of this ellipse. The sun's at one focal point. You'll notice that sometimes the planet is closer to the sun and sometimes the planet is further away from the sun. So the point closest to the sun we call perihelion or from the Greek close to the sun or aphelion for the most distant point in an orbit. So Kepler's second law says that as a planet moves around its orbit it will sweep out equal areas in equal times. So if we look at the picture of a sun here and a planet in an orbit here and out here it will have to travel a smaller distance to create the same area as it would create here moving at a faster speed. So this tells us that planets change the speed at which they move as they move around the Sun and they move at faster speeds when they're at perihelion and slow speeds at aphelion. 
So this idea will tie in very well into what we'll study in the next lesson, which will be the laws of motion. And we'll see that this is a wonderful balance between kinetic energy and potential energy. Kepler's third law is the one mathematical law. And he says the more distant a planet is from the sun, the slower it will move. And Kepler's third law says the orbital period measured in years squared equals the average distance from the sun in astronomical units cubed. So p squared equals a cubed. And when you use this equation, you need to have something orbiting our sun. It has to be measured, the period or the amount of time it takes to make one revolution has to be measured in years. And its average distance has to be measured in astronomical units. So there is an example handout that has how to shows you how to work with Kepler's third law. Um, you'll find this on the website and in Angel. So make sure you take a look at this, and it has some nice examples to work through so you can understand how to use Kepler's third law. The planets orbit the Sun in a counterclockwise direction as viewed from above the Sun's North Pole. And the planets' orbits all are aligned to what astronomers call the ecliptic plane. The story of our greater understanding of planetary motion could not be told if it were not for the work of a German mathematician named Johannes Kepler. Kepler lived in Graz, Austria during the tumultuous early 17th century. Due to religious and political difficulties common during that era, Kepler was banished from Graz on August 2nd, 1600. Fortunately, an opportunity to work as an assistant for the famous astronomer Tycho Brahe presented itself, and the young Kepler moved his family from Graz, 300 miles across the Danube River, to Brahe's home in Prague. Tycho Brahe is credited with the most accurate astronomical observations of his time and was impressed with the studies of Kepler during an earlier meeting. However, Brahe mistrusted Kepler, fearing that his bright young intern might eclipse him as the premier astronomer of his day. He therefore let Kepler see only part of his voluminous planetary data. He set Kepler the task of understanding the orbit of the planet Mars, the movement of which fit problematically into the universes described by Aristotle and Ptolemy. It is believed that part of the motivation for giving the Mars problem to Kepler was Brahe's hope that its difficulty would occupy Kepler while Brahe worked to perfect his own theory of the solar system, which was based on a geocentric model where the Earth is the center of the solar system. Based on this model, the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn all orbit the Sun, which in turn orbits the Earth. As it turned out, Kepler, unlike Brahe, believed firmly in the Copernican model of the solar system known as heliocentric, which correctly placed the Sun at its center. But the reason Mars' orbit was problematic was because the Copernican system incorrectly assumed the orbits of the planets to be circular. After much struggling, Kepler was forced to an eventual realization that the orbits of the planets are not circles, but were instead the elongated or flattened circles that geometers call ellipses. And, the particular difficulties Bra had with the movement of Mars were due to the fact that its orbit was the most elliptical of the planets for which Bra had extensive data. Thus, in a twist of irony, Bra unwittingly gave Kepler the very part of his data that would enable Kepler to formulate the correct theory of the solar system, banishing Bra's own theory. Since the orbits of the planets are ellipses, let us review three basic properties of ellipses. The first property of an ellipse. An ellipse is defined by two points, each called a focus, and together called foci. The sum of the distances to the foci from any point on the ellipse is always a constant. The second property of an ellipse. The amount of flattening of the ellipse is called the eccentricity. The flatter the ellipse, the more eccentric it is. Each ellipse has an eccentricity with a value between zero, a circle, and one essentially a flat line, technically called a parabola. The third property of an ellipse. The longest axis of the ellipse is called the major axis, while the shortest axis is called the minor axis. 
half of the major axis is termed a semi-major axis. Knowing then that the orbits of the planets are elliptical, Johannes Kepler formulated three laws of planetary motion which accurately describe the motion of comets as well. Kepler's first law. Each planet's orbit about the Sun is an ellipse. The Sun's center is always located at one focus of the orbital ellipse. The Sun is at one focus. The planet follows the ellipse in its orbit, meaning that the planet to Sun distance is constantly changing as the planet goes around its orbit. Kepler's second law, the imaginary line joining a planet and the Sun sweeps equal areas of space during equal time intervals as the planet orbits. Basically, that planets do not move with constant speed along their orbits, rather their speed varies so that the line joining the centers of the Sun and a planet sweeps out equal parts of an area in equal times. The point of nearest approach of the planet to the Sun is termed perihelion, the point of greatest separation is aphelion. Hence, by Kepler's second law, a planet is moving fastest when it is at perihelion and slowest at aphelion. Kepler's third law. The squares of the orbital periods of the planets are directly proportional to the cubes of the semi-major axes of their orbits. Kepler's third law implies that the period for a planet to orbit the Sun increases rapidly with the radius of its orbit. Thus, we find that Mercury, the innermost planet, takes only 88 days to orbit the Sun, the Earth takes 365 days, while Saturn requires 10,759 days to do the same. Though Kepler hadn't known about gravitation when he came up with his three laws, they were instrumental in Isaac Newton deriving his theory of universal gravitation, which explains the unknown force behind Kepler's third law. Kepler and his theories were crucial in the better understanding of our solar system dynamics and is a springboard to newer theories that more accurately approximate our planetary orbits. There were still objections to um, Kepler's laws, and a fellow named Galileo Galilei, he came along and removed um, many of those objections. And Galileo um, is considered the father of modern science. He was the first one to start truly applying the scientific method of developing a hypothesis, experimenting, comparing his results to the hypotheses, developing new hypotheses. And so he's considered the father of modern science. And the three objections to Kepler's laws were that the Earth could not be moving because objects in the air, like the clouds and the birds, would be left behind as the Earth moved away from them. Um, their non-circular orbits were not perfect, and the heavens should be perfect. Those were both remnants of the Aristilian view and of the church at the time. And if the Earth were really orbiting the Sun, we should detect stellar parallax, which we had not been able to detect. So he overcame the first objection, the law of nature of motion, and he was able to roll balls down an inclined plane. And by changing the inclined plane, um, he was able to show that unless a force acted on the balls, they would continue to stay in motion. So he showed that an object in motion would stay in motion unless an external force acted upon it. So that allowed the trees and the birds and the clouds all to move along with the Earth. And that also became Newton's first law, which we'll study in the next chapter. The second objection, um, where the Aristilian view said the heavens should be perfect, which means that the planet should be um, circular. And so we saw that 
Taiho's observations of supernova and comets had already kind of challenged this idea, and Galileo got a telescope. He did not invent the telescope. It was a new toy at the time, but he did take a telescope, and he was the first one to turn it towards the sky, and he observed imperfections on the sun, which we now know are sunspots. He looked at the moon, and he was able to show it had valleys and mountains and was not a perfect sphere. So he showed that there were some imperfections in the heavens. So that meant that the planets did not have to follow a perfect circle um, to remain, to make the heavens perfect. The third objection, um, everybody in the past had thought the stars were much closer than what they are. And Galileo, looking at the Milky Way galaxy with his telescope, was able to see that it was made up of an incredible number of stars. And that meant that these stars had to be much, much further away than we ever thought they were. And if the stars are very, very far away, um, we would not be able to observe parallax from the sun. So to clinch the deal, um, he turned his telescope towards Jupiter, and he saw that Jupiter had moons that were orbiting it. And he also saw that Venus went through phases. So looking at Venus and Jupiter, um, the only way to explain the phases of Venus was in a sun-centered system. And since Jupiter had moons that orbited the planet as the planet it orbited the sun, showed that things would remain with the planet as it orbited. So what were the key ideas in this lesson? So we talked about some of the ancient peoples and how they employed scientific thinking, and they were able to make astronomical observations to keep track of time and the seasons and religious ceremonies. Um, they were able to observe planets and the stars, and they developed a system of keeping time. Um, we go back to the Greeks. They were the first to form models of nature, and they were the first to offer an explanation for planetary motion that wasn't based on superstition. So the Muslim community, through the Dark Ages, maintained this information and added to it, um, developed the mathematics, and also helped ignite the um, Renaissance in Central Europe. So Copernicus, Tahu Brahe, and Kepler challenged Ptolemy's idea of an Earth-centered um, solar system, and Kepler developed three laws of planetary motion. The orbit of each planet is an ellipse with the sun at one focus. As a planet moves around its orbit, it sweeps out equal areas in equal times, and the more distant a planet is, the slower it orbits the sun. Galileo was able to solidify these ideas by overturning some of the Aristilian views. So, you can feel free to go back through these slides um, without the vocal commentary um, to study for your exam. So let me know if you have any questions, and goodbye. Well, that's the end of Lesson 3. Um, make sure you check some of the handouts on the website and on ANGEL. Um, there's a laboratory about how to make an ellipse, and there's some help with um, the third law, Kepler's third law. So, as always, let me know if you have any questions, and I hope to be talking to you soon.